Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hey, everyone. My guest today, Kaylin McFerrin, has taken the art of delivering unexpected twists and turns to a whole other level with her latest novel, Soul Seeker. If you haven't read her work before, you can remedy that today. She's absolutely brilliant. But before we get started, here's the inside scoop on Kaylin. Kaylin McFerrin has received more than 50 national literary awards, including a nomination in the prestigious Romance Writers of America Golden Heart Contest for Flaherty's Crossing, a book she and her oldest daughter, best-selling author Christina McMorris, co-wrote in 2008. Her self-published books are written in multiple genres and include award-winning romantic thrillers, mysteries, a time travel adventure, and now a paranormal fantasy. She hopes that her stories are entertaining and that they linger in the minds of readers long after her final twists are revealed. In addition to writing, when she's not traveling between homes in San Diego and Portland, or spoiling her two pups and three grandsons, she enjoys giving back to her community through participation and support of various charitable, medical, and educational organizations, and encourages others to do the same. For more information about Kaylin McFerrin and her work, visit her website at kaylinmcferrin.com. Well, hi, Kaylin. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I should have said welcome back, because I've been looking forward to catching up with you again. (laughs) (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about your new novel, Soul Seeker? Yeah, this is my first attempt at doing a paranormal thriller type book. I've been doing mostly psychological thrillers. Mm -hmm. So, but because I think we've been locked down and this coronavirus thing going on and it kind of put me in kind of a dark mood. (laughs) So I wrote this book that is basically an urban paranormal romance adventure. Now, that's a mouthful. (laughs) It takes you into the world of celestial politics, supernatural demons, guardian angels, soul collectors, and other dark, maligning creatures referred to as humans. (laughs) So the basic storyline for this story is that it's about an evil, manipulating, soul-collecting demon named Crichton Mm -hmm. and his existence. And twisted loyalties are revealed by a murderer's confession. And while awaiting his punishment, Benjamin Bow discloses to his lawyer the true story behind his crime. And following his execution, Crichton continues his malevolent duties until he's kidnapped by a member of the Sovereign Sector. Now, this group of scientists are notorious for experimenting on supernatural creatures. Oh, my gosh. And they force, yeah, it's kind of really twisted. And they force Crichton into a soulmate relationship with the angel he was sent to capture for Lucifer. So it's got a real twist to it. And with all these secrets coming out about who he really is, this creature ends up becoming the target of Lucifer's revenge. And he, in turn, goes on a journey for redemption and freedom. Or he he can also end up being eternally enslaved by Lucifer as punishment. So it's a really dark, twisty story, but it's a lot of fun because there's a little romance involved, too. Well, I feel like the story is very different from what you typically write, but it has the uh-huh. basic elements of of everything you always wrap up in your novels. I mean, it's, it's got a lot of depth and yeah, and and it's so fun. And it's, and this one was scary too, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Wanted to keep you on the edge of your seat a little bit. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned the supernatural element. How, how is it different writing supernatural than psychological thrillers? Was there any difference? Yeah. When I was writing um, my other stories, It was more about the internal functioning or thought processes for people that are kind of flawed, that are going through difficult times in their lives and so forth. Mm -hmm. And writing this supernatural story was basically inventing this whole world that's kind of an underworld existence where there's all these creatures live and, and their thought processes are more leaning toward the dark side. 
Yeah. And so they feed on human souls and they feed on the negativity in the world. And so they contribute to that. And so it was taking my, you know, myself to this very dark and kind of demented place. And it involved a lot of alcohol. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. But it, it involved inventing a place in existence where it's just a very supernatural existence and place where creatures that I invented and some are based on folklore and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it took a little bit of research to be able to create this world with these beings and so forth. And then I just kind of played with their mind processes and kind of turned them a little bit humanistic. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet it was fun to write. Oh, it was. (laughs) Uh So do you believe in angels and demons? Yeah, it's really, it's really strange, but I honestly do. Yeah. Um, I honestly believe there's outside forces that, you know, contribute to the dark things that happen in our existence, in our world. You know, and there's individuals who are dictators in different countries that do very twisted, dark things, mm-hmm. you know. And so, you know, there's some kind of demonic influence to them. That's what I believe personally. And I also believe that there's been times in my life where I've been rescued. And so I'm sure a lot of people feel that, that if they had done a certain thing or gone a certain place, disaster would have befell them, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you're saved at the last minute, or there's a little voice in your head that tells you, you know, don't go in that alley or don't drive down that street. Or there's something that prevents you from doing something and ultimately you find out that something bad happened there that you were saved from and so I consider that like my guardian angel that a voice in my head you know protects me and tells me to to do certain things that prevent me from getting into trouble yeah there's got to be a reason why we do the things we do and and so it can be either a demonic or an angelic influence so yeah I'm I get that. I do believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I think people, it's their conscience, you know, and it's telling them to do, you know, what you do results in certain aftermath, you know, certain effects and, and how you treat people, you know, that ultimately comes back to you tenfold. So it's, I think it's judgment and just knowing right from wrong, but there's some people that don't have the buffers and somehow they, they make wrong choices and it, and it impacts everyone around them. So I think it's very timely, this mm. type of story. So yeah. yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your angel and your demon? Yeah. My demon is actually very conflicted. He is a demon that has been raised in hell to be the number one soul catcher for Lucifer. And Lucifer punishes him brutally all the time. But he accepts his punishment and he's fearful of him. Therefore, he does all these things that he asks him to do to go, you know, after humans, certain humans, and he goes after dark souls and he brings back the souls of angels for him to devour and so mm. forth. So he goes along with this. Basically, part of, partly is because of fear and partly is obligation because he wants to earn his respect. But he's very conflicted and he has empathy, which is unheard of in hell. And so he has these traits that are not normal for a demon, which sets him apart from all the other demons, and he's an outsider. Mm -hmm. His counterpart is Ariel, and she is a guardian angel that was brought down in training, and she's learning how to become sympathetic to humans and how to care for them and look after them and advise them. And they end up tangled up together in a really twisted relationship and are forced into a soulmate kind of relationship, basically. And so they both resent each other and they have to learn to be compassionate toward one another. So it's it's very fun. Different kind of story for me, definitely. Yeah, and it's funny to think about a, a demon with empathy and an angel in training. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but... <laughs> yes. I love that. It's, but Ariel would like to be a little wicked, but she's, you know, she's tempted to be. So it's very fun how it ultimately turns out. Yeah. 
Yeah. And would he like to be a little good? Like, would he like to impress her just a little bit? Yes. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think they both kind of brush against each other, but they also learn from one another. So it's really fun how they ultimately end up together. Right. Now, I have to mention what our reviewer said about your writing style, because she said, and this is a quote, <laughs> McFerrin is fearless when it comes to taking characters and situations to the brink and back. And I just love that sentence. <laughs> it. It, it sometimes, <laughs> because it sometimes feels like authors hold back with their characters. And I was wondering, what do you think is the value behind stretching your characters to their limits? And what does it take to be fearless like you are with your characters? I love doing it. I think it's so much fun because I think it tests your limitations. My own personality is that I'd love to be able to do certain things, but you're always, you know, afraid of what could happen mm -hmm. if you jump out of an airplane or if you um, deep sea dive or something, you always have this little fear of something could go wrong. But I love using characters in the books to push them to the, the brink of despair and then let them figure out how to swim their way back out, you know. <laughs> It's a character building trait that mm -hmm. they learn to discover things about themselves that they didn't think they were capable of. And I think the same thing applies to humans. You know, I mean, there's opportunities for us to try new things. And afterwards, we just apply ourselves because we didn't think we were capable of doing them. Yeah. So it's the same thing when you do writing. You know, you want to push your characters as far as you can. Yeah. Living vicariously through your characters, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier celestial politics, and I love that twist as well. It, it's just a very, it, you're, uh -huh. I think your story is very unique in its genre, just because of all the different uh -huh. kind of spins you put on your characters and the situations. Uh -huh. Now, speaking of celestial politics, and without giving, you know, a lot away, you've also managed to Right. bring a relevant civil rights issue into play. And I'm thinking in, in particular about, uh, oh, there's one part that's the improbability of demons ever accepting a woman being in charge of hell. Yeah. Did current events, uh, like our possibility of having a first woman VP, steer that storyline? or It came to me when I was writing this story. You know, about six months ago, I was, I, you know, I was involved in writing it very heavily. Mm -hmm. And then think politics came out where we may have in the future a female president. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, it was very interesting to me, but also exciting at the same time with the possibility. And so it also, you know, plays into the storyline in the next book mm -hmm. that I'm writing that's, I'm currently writing a sequel to this book. I hadn't planned on it originally, but I had so much fun writing these characters that I wanted to take them further. <laughs> so the next book is called Annihilation. And it's basically that the female character that takes over, Hell, becomes out of control. She becomes so power hungry and um, she enacts a war between angels and between Hell and the demons and and basically, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and so, but it's it's going to be a fun battle kind of story. And But I love the idea of challenging, you know, all the characters in the story because they have to comply and go along with her beliefs, but she's going to be outrageous. Mm. So it's just, it's fun just to let your characters take over and let them run the story. Yeah. When I, when I finished, I saw her potential. And I thought, geez, now there's a woman running hell. It would be so much fun if she just drank it all, you know, drank the Kool-Aid and went <laughs> crazy. And, <you> know? <laughs> so I'm halfway into that story. So it's going to be a fun outcome when I get done. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I love that a woman being in charge of hell. Going crazy yeah. is a new spin on it. It's very celestial and it's very contemporary and it's very current event worthy, too. <laughs> Yes. I mean, yeah. it just kind of reminds me of what's going on in the United States right now. So just it sounds, does. Sounds I relevant. It, I think, yeah, I think politics definitely impacts me. <laughs> it definitely influenced my writing. So yeah. it's, yeah. So it's, you might recognize some, you know, similar things going on in the story that are pertinent to what's happening in yeah. our society right now.
Well, speaking of all that, I mean, 2020 hasn't exactly been a banner year. What does your life look like living through this pandemic? And how are you and your husband surviving it? Well, in between writing, okay, so we, we now have, I live um, on the coast, basically. Um, I, I reside in both San Diego, California, where I have a home in Mission Hills. And then I have a second home in Portland, Oregon, where I I go to visit um, my grandchildren, and mm. so we go back and forth every month to see everybody. So I love this existence with traveling a bit, and it feels safer now that, you know, we can get on an airplane and, and feel a little bit safer with travel. But um, I'm also very busy with my gardens, and so we have a wonderful property here in California, and anything you stick in the ground grows, which is miraculous, and oh, so wow. we have all kinds of fruits and so we have bananas that are like four dozen bananas that are going to be ready to pick in about a month and um, we have oranges up to gigi and the lemons and limes and mangoes and papayas anything you can think of we can go out at loads of avocados so anytime you want to go out and pick something in the garden you can and so Oh, I think wonderful. the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn over a little dirt and maybe put a little vegetable garden in too. So it's therapy for me to get out, you know, and, and not have to think about anything when your hand's in the dirt. So yeah, and basically that's, you know, that and just having people visit once in a while and take care of the puppies and, mm-hmm. and just um, seeing friends off and on. It's how I survive these dark days. Oh my gosh, that all sounds so amazing. So now, how up? You said you go to Portland once a month. So basically, I'm here for three weeks in San Diego, and then I spend a week in Portland every month. Oh, how fun. So that way, I can still drive up to see my mom. She's 94 years old, and she lives on the Hood Canal up in uh, by the Olympic Forest. Mm-hmm. And so I'm able to drive up and see her once a month, and I, I try to make an appearance. Um, and she being a wonderful Irish woman that she is, she loves to cook. And so when she knows we're coming, she will cook all day long to prepare meals for us. So it's her excitement to have us visit. So yeah, she's a tough lady. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Now you're, I follow you on Facebook because I, I, you're so fun to follow. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Thank you. Uh, yeah. I try to keep it exciting. <laughs> you, well, you do. You keep it interesting. It's not just, you know, buy my book. Yeah. I think you have to remind authors that people are more complex. You know, mm. they enjoy a good book, but they want to know about you. They want to know what your interests are and what you do, you know, in your off time when you're not busy writing. And so it's an opportunity for people to get to know me and, yeah. and um, you know, different aspects about my life. And I love sharing it. And I see different people at um, writing events, not so much right now, but I have. Mm-hmm. And it's fun for they because they really know the things that I'm interested in. And we have conversations we can talk about other than books. Right. So that's really interesting right. and fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in Portland, you were always busy with uh, a nonprofit that you started, uh, Soulful. Yeah, yeah, I have to. Yeah, I have to explain that now. Yeah. So we we ran the Soulful Giving Foundation. Um, my husband and I did for ten years, actually twelve. But we ran an event that we did the Soulful Giving Blanket Concert for ten years. And last year was my last year mm-hmm. for doing it. It just turned out that. It it was kind of a blessing that it was the last event, only because we couldn't run it this year, If we even if we wanted to, Mm. because it it involved 5,000 people on our property, and and it took a lot of coordinating to put it all together. But what we ultimately did was we donated our home, and it's a 15-acre estate on the Sandy River. We donated it to um, Randall Children's Hospital so it could be a retreat and place for children and their families to go and nurses and doctors. And so it was the best gift we could ever give. And we're so thrilled that we could do that. Yeah. And so I won't, I won't be doing that event anymore, but I'm looking to get more involved in Southern California for different community organizations. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm, I'm doing right now. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we can get out and about more. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We, I have this neighborhood group that was so much fun. 
and there are ladies, there is 80 of them from oh my, my and that's how I got to know a lot of my neighbors. But there's 80 of these ladies get together on a second Tuesday of every month and they have a cocktail hour and they bring, you know, drinks and appetizers and everything else. And they all get together and I got to meet so many neighbors that way. And since the coronavirus shut down, I miss them so much. <laughs> yeah. You know, they're such a neat group. They're all very diverse you know, all walks of life and all different kinds of businesses that they run. They, some own wineries and some are jewelers and and it's they're very crafty in their own rights and it's just fun to get together and exchange ideas with them. So I'm missing all those girls right now. Yeah, I'll so, bet. Yeah. I know yeah. we're all missing that human interaction right now. I mean, I, I think my day-to-day oh, so operations haven't changed too much because I work at home and you know Mm -hmm. I'm at my desk and you probably do the same but but it's just that that outside interaction that just oh yeah we're fortunate because we have some a few neighbors Mm -hmm. that we have stayed in contact through this whole pandemic yeah and every once in a while we get together for dinner at each other's houses because we feel safe in doing that but it's like you have to have this little bubble you know, of friends, and it really limits you to interact with other people. And so the only way I see my other neighbors right now is walking down the street with my puppies. And so we just kind of walk on opposite sides of the street and wave at each other. (laughs) And, and, you know, you can only wish the best for one another and hope this thing ends soon. Yeah, yeah, right. And hopefully uh, everyone has something to keep them busy until that time comes. I know you've been busy writing you said you've already started writing the sequel to Soul Seeker, which sounds amazingly fast to me. Uh, how long did it take you to write Soul Seeker? It actually took me from beginning, uh, from the concept to, to completing it about six months. Wow. Yeah. But when I write, I write like 10 pages a day. Mm. But when I write, I correct as I go. So it's like I'm a, an editing writer. Mm-hmm. And I'm also a pantser, which means that I don't plot my stories. I have an idea in my head where the story is going to go. And each chapter, I try to decide each chapter is going to have a purpose. And that's how I write the stories. But I don't do, um, which a lot of authors do, is using post-it notes and drawing up diagrams and all that. It's mm-hmm. all in my head. Oh, wow. And so it's sometimes I get in a, a mode and it's hard to shut down because I know I need to get this idea out or I'm going to lose it. So it's good and bad at the same time when you write that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I bet your fan base loves it because there's nothing more disappointing to me than having to wait for the next book in the series. Yes. <laughs> well, I try to, I'm try. i trying very hard to get one book out a year. And that's, yeah. that's my goal. That's great. So, yeah. yeah. So do you have any idea how far this series is going to go or, or not yet? I don't yet. It's going to depend on how the book ends. Mm. So I have ideas how the story is going to go, but until I get my characters in there, and they really dictate a lot of how the story, you know, evolves. I've got a new rogue character that's going to come into play. So it's going to be interesting if that person warrants their own story or if I just end it with them Uh. being a hero or something, you know? Right. Well, it's definitely something to look forward to, and I know your readers are going to be happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. One of the many things I love about your writing is that you hook the reader right off the bat, but you never let them go. Yeah, I love it. It's so weird because I have a daughter, Christina McMorris. She's a U.S. Today New York Times bestselling author, and we work together um, years ago on writing our first book called Flaherty's Crossing. Mm-hmm. And which the thing that we learned by writing that book is you always end each chapter with a hook. Mm-hmm. So you you always want to end it so that, and this is great advice for anybody who writes thrillers or suspense novels, is you always end the chapter where the reader can set the book down or they feel like guilty setting it down because they want to know what's coming next, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's a lot of fun to always end the chapters that way, but we both learn from doing that kind of writing that it's the best way to keep the reader's attention and hold on to it for a long time. And so I've got different 
people who have told me when they start reading one of my books that they stay up all night long because they can't find a place to close it and, yeah. you know, put it down. So, but that's a sign of a, a, a really good, you know, a thrill writer, you know, you want to capture their attention and hold on to it as long as possible. Absolutely. So that's absolutely. what I attempt to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so you end each chapter with a hook, but then you start off the, yeah. the book with a hook too. And I love, love, love yeah. the way you open Soul yeah. Seeker uh, with a poem. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I used to write poetry a long time ago. And I thought, how fun if I put a poem at the beginning of each one of my books. Mm -hmm. And it kind of gives you a little flavor what the book is going to be about. But it also gives you the tone of the theme of the story. Yeah. So, um, but I did that with this book too, which was a lot of fun. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I love the poem. I wonder if you might be able to share it with us today. Oh, I'd love to. Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is the way it goes. Poe lived a sad life with his beautiful wife. Their young child's cruel death brought them heartache and strife. Their grown son was handsome and brilliant indeed. His future looked bright, though he was a bad seed. A dark demon smelled blood and followed his leads to steal a black soul for appalling misdeeds. He quoted God's verses, his eyes were bright green. His mark of the devil was left on the scene. Poe shared his concerns, he issued fair warning. His son fortified his ego by scorning. Even with pleas, there were no second chances. The dark demon dismissed all circumstances. Blinded by malice, filled by death and despair, Poe followed the bait and was trapped in a snare. He shot his magnum. His son hit the gravel. Appalled by the scene, his mind would unravel. Yet was the blame thought? Did angels intercede? When the demon used trickery in his plot to succeed. Only time would tell in this story of woe when villains are blind to the grief they bestow. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is chilling. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind of like a pirate ship, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and <laughs> I mean, and and listeners, if you don't want to go out and buy that book right now, you don't have a pulse. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guarantee you will have fun reading this book. Yeah. I guarantee it. Kaylin, is there anything else you wanted to add today? No, I just, I thank you so much for your wonderful support and the support of all the readers who continue to support a lot of independent writers. Um, I just think it's, there's so much imagination in this world and it's, it's fun to see it shared between so many different avenues of creativity. So I just encourage everybody to try to find something positive to focus on during these difficult times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and, and for sharing a little bit about you and, and your work. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for my interview with Kaylin McFerrin, author of Soul Seeker. For more information on Kaylin and her work, visit her website at kaylinmcfarren.com. And be sure to check out our other interviews at InsideScoopLive.com. 